rolling. <coughs> uh, interview with Mr. Uh, Edward W. Broga, uh, 24 January 2001, Syracuse Thompson Road Armory. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hassel, and videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Mr. Broga, tell me about where you were born and raised. I was born in Rome, New York, but raised in Syracuse all my life. I yes. lived there, period. <laughs> And uh, you graduated schools? High school. High school. What was your family like? I mean, what kind of family did you come from? Uh, generally, with, uh, just an average family. My father, he wasn't the best. He, he was out of work a lot and on welfare and things like that. And I, I didn't want to be like my father. I, I was going to work and had the things I had because of what my father had in the past, and basically that's about it. So what year did you graduate high school from? Oh my god, I don't know. I was about uh, 18, I guess. I went to, I dropped out of high school and then I went back to continuation school to finish the high school business, uh -huh. and that's about it. And I went out working, did work then, not too long, then uh, of course, I went and they called me in the service. Where were you when uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed? What were you doing? Oh boy. Probably home, working. I was probably working at the fairgrounds uh, uh, of the Army supplies, you know, and then bulk and they were shipping them out and stuff like that. I was in uh, a depot there, and that's what I was doing toward the end. Now, uh, this was at the fairgrounds? Yeah, at the fairgrounds. Okay, tell me about that. I'm not too familiar with it. The Army took over part of the fairgrounds? Yeah, they had supplies. They brought them in, we shipped them back out. And I operated one of those uh, toll lifts things. That's what I did until the, the I was informed I had to go into service, you know. And I, I wished I had uh, enlisted in the Air Force, but I didn't. I just went in. What kind of supplies were you handling at, uh, at the depot? I don't know. Everything was boxed, so I don't know. Did they uh, did they take over existing buildings there, or did they build their own buildings? No, no, no. Just existing buildings. Uh -huh. The supply, you know, and they just build them up, and then uh, the building itself. That's all. But were there any troops stationed there, or was it? Not that I know of. No, no, not at that time. No. And when did you enter the service? <laughs> oh boy. Forty, what was it? Forty-three. February of forty-three. Yeah, because I spent three years in the service. Uh -huh. So I got out at forty-five. So I must have been about forty-two then, huh? So in forty-one and forty-two, you were working at the Syracuse Army Depot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And about how many people were working at the depot? You know? There were an awful lot. No. What was life uh, like in Syracuse uh, in? Uh, 41, 42. I mean, was a lot of uh, impact of the war? Generally, no. No. Rationing, scrap. Yeah, out. gasoline was. <laughs> that was one of the main factors. You couldn't get gasoline, you know, and stuff like that. that that's about all I can remember. Uh -huh. Okay, so you, you went in February 43. Where were you inducted? Downtown in the Army, Syracuse Army. Yes. And in then there. what happened? Where did you go from there? Uh, the armored, uh, armored the triangle one. I think you've got the patch light. Oh, mine's a little different, but well, yeah. the, the triangle one. That's where I had my uh, basic training. Fort Knox. Right. Fort okay. Knox. And what were you trained as? Just I had the basic training. Uh huh. And uh, they didn't have anything uh, special. I was the uh, a replacement, more or less, until I went overseas. Uh -huh. Then I, I uh, well, they shift us around. I went to Africa, and from Africa I joined the, the 102nd Cavalry, mechanized. The 102nd Cavalry? Yeah, the 102nd. Yeah. Cavalry mechanized, though. Now, that was the National Guard outfit, wasn't it? I don't know if it was or not. Mm -hmm. But there was a special outfit, that's all I know of. 
Glad I got in that outfit, not the regular army. I didn't want the army. I guess maybe I wasn't, a, my sight wasn't very good when uh, they put me on a rifle range. They, uh, I never could hit the targets. They took me three different times on there to make me qualify. But I guess it got tired of me going down there, so they let me go through anyway. Well, let's back up a little bit. How did you get from the United States to uh, North Africa? I shipped uh, overseas on a boat, troop boat. One of those tiers, you know, they're all up and down. You had bunks. Uh -huh. And our, uh, the ship was quarantined because there was a uh, spinal meningitis epidemic there at that time. And the, the guy that had it, he was right in the next bunk with me. So I stayed there for a little while, but after that, we, Went out to line, went to Africa. I joined that one. Let's see, Africa. I went to the invasion of southern France. Oh, Italy, then France, then Germany. I had the invasion of southern France. That's what I was in. Now, is North Africa where you joined the 102nd Cavalry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> 102nd. Now, what, what did you do with them? What was your job? <coughs> I was uh, on a half track, I mounted with, with that big gun, you know, the turret gun. I drove that for a while, but I didn't wind up doing it when I got in, into the actual fighting. I was in, I was with a, my corporal in a jeep. Our main job was just to feel the Germans out, get back, and then the army went up. That was our own, our main job. So when did you first see combat? I guess the invasion of southern France. Right, from North Africa you went to Italy. Yeah. But you weren't in combat in Italy. No, we was running. We was in, uh, in combat, <coughs> but we was chasing them all, you know, the chasing the Germans out, and that's all we were doing. And our, our main thing was just to, you know, feel out them where they were and come, retreat. And we were just running, running, running all the time in that respect. Until we got the invasion of southern France and that was that was rough. Tell me about that. Did you did you go into the assault waves? <sighs> no, we were all by ourselves. Uh -huh. Our unit by ourselves. And when we come off the boat, when you had a got a chance to get into the inland, we went in. And we were just like you say, we were just the feelers. <coughs> so when was the, uh, uh, so you landed on the uh, the beaches, the beaches had already been secured, and then you moved inland. Yeah. Uh, when was the first time you came in contact with the Germans? In France, yeah. Was it soon after the uh, invasion or? Uh, yeah, soon after that. Uh -huh. What happened? Well, we, uh, let's see, we tracked down the Germans. We, uh, we, and, uh, this, this one group was the headquarters of the Germans. Uh, it was a small outfit. We took them as a prisoner. We treated them well. One thing, okay. Then, after we was very short, Time, not very long, they called the Panzer Division to come in. They took us over. And that's where I got a hit with the shrapnel. And I, I carried the open scar. Uh -huh. And I was taken prisoner then. They, uh, they lined us up. They was ready to shoot us down. But uh, the headquarters people said, Nix, we treated those real good, and that's why the only reason why we was kept alive. There wasn't very many of us, just a small outfit. But I could see that German tank come and putting that gun right there, and I go, oh no. One blast, and he, they killed quite a few of our, our outfits. I was wounded, and then taken prison. They took us, then riding back into, I uh, went up in Munich, uh, Moosberg, little Stalag 7A. They, stri they stripped me down 
I had just my pants and the sh army shirts, and of course, you know, and they took everything away from me. And I lived in those for about nine months in the same clothes. There wasn't enough water to even wash yourself without <coughs> trying to drink water in that respect. Now, let me see if I understand this correctly. Uh, you had captured a German headquarters group. Yeah. And then immediately were captured by the Germans yourself. Yeah. They, they in turn, because, uh, I don't know, somebody, they probably knew that their headquarters would stop and they didn't want to know, and uh, that tank came up and we knew we had it then. How close was the tank to you? Well, from here to over there. So it was only a matter of a few few yards and you're staring down a German tank barrel. Yes, sir. <laughs> that gun, I can remember, that third gun, I can see that German putting that like that. Uh oh. Not really any place to go. No, there wasn't. No. At that point, you must have thought you were about to die. I, I didn't worry so much about that. You know, my biggest worry, coming home in the basket. That was more of a worry to you than. Yeah, dying, I didn't, I didn't mind. But coming home, losing arms or legs, that worried me more than anything else. Did that, did that influence the way you acted, or? Did that change the way you uh, behaved in the field? The fact that you were more concerned about being crippled? Parry. Yeah. Parry. And then when, uh, when they, after they took us, there's a couple of experiences. Oh, I'll give you one before I was captured. The, my corporal and I, we was a, a point bam to go down and feel the outfit out. We went down this one road and we, we, was, we went so far, we knew the Germans were up in the hills and uh, we were just, just surveying the, the hillside and stuff like that. And all of a sudden another corporal and another jeep came up and said, the captain wanted to talk to my corporals. So we had to turn around and come back. As we turned around and come back, the Jerry's lobbed a, a mortar shell right in the middle of that jeep. I was one of those incidents. And then when I was a prisoner of war, they put us in those uh, boxcars, four by eight boxcars. Yeah. All right. And uh, we slept in barns. Of course, they push us around and things. But and, and this, this, this one incident of when we was in the boxcars, they're supposed to have the Red Cross marks on the top of the box cars. But the Americans were you know, so leery of that, they strafed us, okay? The, uh, the German train went through a, a little valley, so it was up like that, and the, the Germans got out. They took their machine guns and they went on the, 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 mo on the mounds there on each side. And if you open the doors at all, they would have shot us down. But in the meantime, the American planes, they strapped the upper part of the boxcar. We was laying down on the floor. You know, they had, had quite a few of us in those boxcars. They were called 40 by 8s, but we had about 140 in. So they strafed the whole tops of those boxcars, and we had no choice. We were either going to be killed by the Americans, or we were going to be killed by the Germans, because they had the guns up on the, on the mound. And ready to, you open the doors, and we were dead. Now, this was en route to uh, Stalag uh, 7A. 7A. Uh -huh. okay. And you were at Stalag 7A for about nine months? Approximately. T tell me, take it from the beginning when you arrived at the, at the camp. What was it like when you first got to the, to the camp? German camp? Yeah. What was it like? Well, I should have brought some pictures. I got a, you know, I got the POW booklet, you know, and I, I had I had my Stalag 7A, and I had the, uh, it's just like army camp life, you know, rows and rows of camps, and of course we was tiered high, uh, five or six tiers high, and for us and that, and um, and it's just rough living there. We ration for food. Of course, I lost. I'm 200 pounds. I'm down about 100 pounds when I come out.
but when they took us into camp and into Munich to work on the boxcars, uh, they gave us uh, potato soup. Otherwise, we just get what they call grass soup. So rations were very slim at the time. Yeah, very slim. Once in a while, we'd get a care package, okay? In the care package, we had about 10 guys on that, and he, he probably got about two or three pieces out of the whole thing. But with me, I'm a non-smoker. I got about three or four cigarettes out of the pack. Those are just like gold to me. Because even the Germans like the American cigarettes. I bought food for a cigarette. And that's how I survived uh, my starvation part. What kind of food did you buy with cigarettes? A little flat. Uh, they're German bread, oh. mostly. Do you remember what the exchange rate was? You, how much could you get for a cigarette? One cigarette, one loaf of bread. Really? Yeah. Like I say, the cigarettes are like gold. And I'm glad I never smoked. <laughs> and I still don't smoke. And what, would you daily, what was your daily life like? I mean, what was your routine in camp? What, well, the usual, they got us up and they had roll call and checked and see if everybody was there. And then most of the time we, the elf, most of the time I'd have to go out to work, get in the boxcars and go into Munich and work. And we had a couple occasions where the Americans come over and they was bombing it. And they put us in a bomb place proof for us, but uh, I one experience of hearing those bombs coming down, and you can hear them whistling, that's how close they were to us. What were the German guards like? Some of them were pretty good and others weren't. Who ran the camp, I mean, in terms of the Americans? I mean, you were all soldiers, right? All enlisted men? Yeah, yeah. Well, there was mixed. They had, they had Russians, and they had uh, uh, English, and uh, Australians, I think. So did you have some kind of chain of command within the camp, or...? I, I, that I don't know. That I don't know. I can't remember. Anyway, I, and at that time, I got sick. I, I guess I had a bad case of arthritis, because I was real bad in my legs. Uh -huh. I couldn't work. And I had a... I think he, uh, he was a captain, he was a, a doctor, a trooper, a, a, a paratrooper, you know, one of these guys. He was in camp. Uh -huh. He took care of me. And uh, I was in, in their offside to one side to, to take care of the sick, you know. And this uh, captain took care of me. And after I come out of service and I, and I was going to the VA and complaining that my legs were bad and all stuff like that, it was too late. The captain died just before I got in, here. and his son wrote and told me. He said, uh, "It's too bad." He said, "My father died, and uh, he would have definitely helped you." But so I've been fighting the VA all this time, but I I wind up with a nervous condition. Uh, it was, they paid me 30 percent, mm -hmm. and the arthritis. They just had to take care of me, and they couldn't do anything about that. I am better, of course and my nervous condition, uh, they gave it to me. It was 30%. That was the most they gave me. I had it for about two or three years. All of a sudden, they had a big drive. They cut everybody, and they cut me down to 10%. Ooh. Okay. So uh, it's been quite a few years. I've been fighting them, fighting them. I had to go in, get exam. They denied me. They even sent the reports to Washington. They denied me. So about six, seven years ago, my wife and I, we both were bad, and she went in the hospital, I went in the hospital. She was one week out the next week, and we've done that several times. But the, the second time she went in, uh, I went in with her, and I, I thought I was losing my wife. Well, that was too much for me. I, I passed out, uh, stuff like that, and I was having my condition, which, the, uh, the uh, VA said that I was all right. So after I got this other doctor at the community, I said, uh, what was wrong with me? He told me exactly what I had 
I, that's all I want to know. I took that report and went back up to the VA hospital. In six weeks, I had my disability back to 30 percent. How long ago was this? Six years ago. Six years. So it was about 30 years I didn't have it. And they wouldn't pay me. They only paid me back for about six months. Let's go back to the, uh, the prison camp for a moment. Was there ever any talk of uh, attempting to escape? Yeah. What was, it, what was that like? It was really not too much, really, because uh, we were just uh, soldiers. We had no, uh, we was in a group of our own, like, uh, we were the working ones, okay? And uh, there wasn't too much activity in that respect. They, uh, they had a, a small camp one side with the Russians. Mm -hmm. They tried it. They could never do it. So the, the Germans, <laughs> I have to laugh that, the Germans had their police dogs and they, they had to go in their camp through the Russians. So one time and they just let the dogs go in. The dogs never come back. You know what the Russians did? They ate the dogs. They ate the dogs. The Germans treat the Russians differently than they treated the Americans? I think so. <coughs> Did you ever, or any of the other American soldiers, have contact with the Russians? Uh, not that I know of. We knew they were off the one side. In this episode with the dogs, uh, we heard about it. <laughs> what about uh, the forced labor you were involved in? What, uh, what kind of work did the Germans make you do? We had a, uh, they took us out, just clean up the mess. It was out like uh, uh, the terminals and the railroad tracks and just clean up the, the debris. And that's and about all. Did you, uh, did you ever have any problems with the German civilians? No, we weren't involved in too much, no. We've seen, we've seen a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it, the Jews, they were in a special, yeah, uh, robe, you know, prison robes, that's about all. So, when did you get liberated from the prison camp? Uh, when uh, the, what you call, came in. They came in. They liberated us, but the war was over shortly after that. Because everybody before they came in, everybody, every, and all the Germans were gone, even the civilian. They just blocked in. Of course, I was still in that, that sick bay business. In fact, I was going to bring the picture. There was a reporter from Syracuse at the time I, I got liberated, and we got talking. He took a picture of it. I don't know where the heck my picture is. It's in the Herald Journal on a Sunday paper. And I was going to bring it to you, and I couldn't find it. I was telling my wife, I said, I don't know where it disappeared to. I had it all together with my discharge and everything else like that. And it that showed a good been, example. That would have been a great picture to see. Uh, maybe you can still get it, maybe, to the, uh, to the Herald Journal. <clears throat> it was on a Sunday, it was in the Sunday paper. And I had a big splash about it. What, sometime in uh, early May or late April? Yeah. Uh, do you remember the actual day you were liberated? I mean, you were in the sick bay. Uh... No, no, I can't. <laughs> what happened to you after that? Uh, they took me, fed me uh, eggnog to get me fattened up. They sent me home, and then I went uh, up north. What was his name, honey? Up north. I was a couple of weeks there, recuperating. Iceberg. No, 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 no. That's a well-known place. Lake Placid. Lake so, Placid. No. Lake Placid. It could be. And uh, I was there for two weeks, and then I was, and they said, uh, "Well, we got you assigned to go over to Japan." I said, well, "What? Yeah, you're ready to go. Be shipped out." Well, prisoner of war, I got two weeks, and a couple, about a month home, and I got to go out. And then they would get me right in, and all of a sudden they said, 
they got a point system coming up. Well, I'm more qualified for it, so that was it. And I, I got out on the point system because I had more than enough points to qualify. They wanted me to stay in the service, but, uh, and they said they was going to give me uh, all kinds of stripes. I said, look, I said, you didn't give me the stripes when I was there, and I was entitled to it. You didn't give me, I was a private first class. They didn't bump me up that much. And they said, oh, we'll, we'll give you sergeant stripes. And I said, no, no. So you, were, you actually got out before the, the, uh, the war ended with Japan? That's right. Yeah. So tell me, what did you do when you got out? Well, I had problems with my arthritis, my legs, I couldn't walk. So I stayed home for a little while and then I went to work after that. What kind of work? What kind of work? Uh, I worked in uh, an auto store. I was doing brake jobs, uh, clutches, and stuff like that, rebuilding. Is this something you had learned to do before the Army? or No, no, no. And then I, I was getting disgusted that, with that, and uh, I took an apple, uh, a test for my best qualifications to the Army. They had set up, and they said, uh, my line of work is uh, clerical or uh, mechanics. I said, okay. Then I got another job in the bus terminal. I was nothing but a parts cleaner. I had that for about a year. Well, just before that, I put an application in for the VA hospital, an application in for the post office. It was five years before I actually heard from them. And would you believe that <coughs> both applications come in about the same time? And by comparison, price-wise, the post office was better. Mm -hmm. So I took the post office. And that's where I worked the rest of my life. I put in 30 years, I'm retired. I got 20 years of retirement under good old Uncle Sam. Good. And that's where I am. Got married? Yeah. I got married. Kids? No. I got two adopted. One girl, one boy. Now, I, my wife couldn't have any. She had a problem. The, uh, your children, they ever ask you about uh, your experiences in the war? No, I told them a few. Now, more so, my son now, he, he's asked a little bit more about it. And I told him, I said, I want you to have all my medals. I got, I'm going to have two Purple Hearts, and I got one for the wound, yeah. and they're giving me another one for P.O.W., which I'm qualified for that. So I'll have two Purple Hearts. Did you apply for your P.O.W. medal? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the one, yeah. It's been three years, and I still haven't got that one. Yeah, they're a little, uh, they're a little slow. Yeah, I was supposed to get it back in November. Here it is, what? January, going to February. There's still three months behind. I got a, a letter. Finally, they got uh, the official form, you know, for the application for it. Uh -huh. I seen Lois Reinhardt, and finally I went to her and said, "Hey, she filled it out. She's a, she's a Purple Heart, uh, what you call it, in the VA hospital." You know, you're also entitled to a decoration from the state of New York. Yeah, I put that in too. I, th I think I talked to him. So I made two applications. I said one back to you and one to New York State for the, the valid uh, medal. That's what I've done. I haven't heard anything as yet. What else did you sort of ask you about uh, concerning the war? What's he interested in? Gee, I don't know. Oh, just, just general, how, what I did and how I was wounded and stuff like that. Well, let's go back here for a minute. Uh, the uh, 102nd Cavalry, what kind of group was that? Were they good officers, bad officers? Yeah, they were good, but I had one officer, he had a brown eye and a blue eye. That stuck out with me. And he's one of these cocky officers. He was in armored car, and we was running like crazy as usual. He was in this armored car and he was strutting around. He strutted a little bit too much. I guess there was a German sniper. Got him right between the eyes. I felt sorry for the man, but 
What about your sergeants? What were they like? Huh? Your sergeants, what were they like? <laughs> I couldn't get used to them because I was in basic training, then I went to this outfit, and, and like I said, this one, I was uh, close to this one corporal, and that's the only thing that I know of. Okay. Why were you close to him? I don't know. I, I, he had a pick on me. I, I was, like I say, in his Bantam, and uh, we was together a lot. Uh -huh. So, so he and I, are, I think, are very lucky in that respect because we didn't get that shell. You said you did a lot of running around. Chasing. 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 You know, seeing where the Germans are. Yeah. I wasn't like the Army, you know. I'm glad I wasn't in the Army. <laughs> I, I, I really enjoyed this outfit. Did you ever keep up with anybody uh, you were in that outfit with after the war? No, I tried to, but I couldn't get a hold of anybody. Half of them were, well, I can say, or half or three quarter of my outfit was uh, P.O.W. And there was a few, and there was one fellow I thought, I call him Abutha. His name is not really that, but Abutha, and that's all I can remember. He's, he's, he's a big guy like I was. And I guess uh, I heard that he finally got, he wasn't a prisoner of war. I heard that he was driving a, a staff car for one of the generals. So. But the rest of them, like I say, I couldn't get in touch with any of them. But I heard about this one fellow, that's all. I would like to get to know some of them. Probably the most of them weren't dead by now. And I'll be 78 this November, right? And uh, like I say, that book that I get, they're dying more and more all the time. And even my local paper are averaging about six and eight. Uh, or, or two veterans. They're all in my bracket, 75 to 80 years old. <laughs> I'm going on 78. I'm hoping to live a few more years. Hope so. When you look back now, after all these years, is there anything that particularly stands out in your mind about the time you were in? No. Maybe it could have got a better job if I stayed out of the service or something like that, but no. I went in, I, 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 like I say, I had to have the job done. I went, did my duty. Do you made a, a, a difference? Was it important to do? No. no. Are you proud of your service? Yes. Yes. And like I say, when I come out of service, I had uh, what they call a 10-point preference when I applied for the, the post office. That put me up so I can get a job quicker and more than so than some of the other fellows, which was in my favor. And I went in as a, they call it a driver mechanic. What I did at the beginning of the first couple of years was uh, I delivered bulk mail. I got mail from the train station, delivered to the main post office, and then from the main post office, we distributed the broken down mail to the substations all around. That was my job for about two years. And then they got to the point where they didn't have any uh, vehicles. Then they started to bring in the vehicles. Well, then there was a new job creating. I got in to the stock room, and I was called a storekeeper. So I was in charge of all the parts. I had uh, the work. I had uh, a budget that I had to follow and stuff like that. A uh, hundred thousand dollars, you know, spent for the, all the equipment, the vehicles, stuff like that, because they were building up in trucks now. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Something we haven't covered that perhaps we should have? Uh, yeah. There's one thing. I heard. It's only hearsay. I was talking to another fellow. I don't know if he was a prisoner of war. I don't think so. He was just a service guy. But he said the Germans are paying those POWs that were working. They were getting it. I said, I didn't hear nothing about it. No information was through the POW book or anything like that. I would like to get that money if I'm entitled to it. That's the only thing I care about.
I'm you worth probably about six, eight thousand dollars. I would like it. If I'm entitled to it, I would like it. And you haven't heard anything about it? No, nothing. I can't apply for it or anything. They said it was a quick, a one, uh, one quick deal. That's the only thing. Did you talk to the, uh, the VA about it? No. 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 So, I, like I say, it was only hearsay, so I don't know what to do. Well, how long ago did you hear about this? About uh, two months ago, wasn't it, Matt? When we went to this uh, restaurant, and we, one thing led to another. I'm not sure. Uh, I think your best bet would be to ask a VA counselor to see if they can tell you anything. Uh, the, to my recollection, when the peace side, when the peace treaty was finally signed with Germany, mm -hmm. that ended all the claims uh, uh -huh. for POW reparation. But I could be wrong. Uh, like I say, it was only hearsay, and I couldn't believe it that they said. <coughs> of course, our the prison, the German prisoners in this country, they were well treated. So if the, they said that the Germans had said they was going to do that for all the work in POWs, that don't mean the corporals, the witch girl, just the one like I, I'm a working soldier, you know, and I had to work. Did you, uh, do you have a, a regular is benefits counselor at the VA you can talk to? No, not. What about your county VA uh, or state? Division of Veterans Affairs. I don't know. I don't know nothing. I just found out through him that I could send this application for this merit award. I didn't know anything about it. And I read upon all this stuff. If I'm entitled to it, I want it. That's all I. I feel I've done my job if I'm entitled to it. Right. If I'm not, I ain't gonna be mad at it. It's just like my disability. I farm ever since I come out of service. But in that low period, to me, after I got, I got disgusted, but uh, when, with my wife being in the hospital that six years ago, when that doctor gave me that report, that's all I wanted. And there was no dickering. I went back up to the VA and I had no problem. Like I said, he only paid me about six months back. I'm happy with it. The VA is, is uh, they're a wonderful group of people to take care of. Good. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh.